think the most important thing I've learned so far is that all the speakers are having trouble with staying in the box. So I think that is a broader leadership uh, convention that we can take away from, uh, from today's session. Um, but so far, I've really enjoyed the conversation that we've had this morning. Um, as Ed said, I want to take a little bit uh, of a different take on this subject because I think we all aspire to become a great place to work. And I think in all the companies that I've been in, we've had different frameworks, we've had different models, but we're all at different parts of our organizational journey. So when I joined Polycom about two years ago, uh, we were really looking at becoming a great place to work, you know, headquartered here in the Bay Area, where obviously the demand for talent continues to be a challenge, especially you know, in the engineering space that I think we all compete for. And as I was talking to somebody earlier, you know, what's gonna make somebody pick up the call um, from one of my recruiters or accept a LinkedIn email from one of my recruiters versus an Apple or a Google or some of the other tech firms in the Valley. And one of those differentiators is becoming a great place to work. So about a year ago, we had three different locations in the Bay. We were rebranding the company, everything from a logo perspective. We were accelerating our hardware to software transformation. And we were really becoming you know, a Tech Valley, uh, Silicon Valley firm. We really moved the headquarters down here into, into San Jose. And as part of that journey, the CEO pulled me aside and said, how can we do this great place to work thing? I want to get on one of those lists, right, at Fortune. So he had the right idea, didn't really know how to go about doing it. So started thinking about the various places that I had been, also looking at the company that we were trying to be, and put some ideas and a framework together for how we could make that transformation and how we could make it to one of those lists. Um, full disclosure, we're still not on that list. We've got a long way to go, um, but at least we've got some ideas about how we're gonna approach it. But I think the most important thing for me, you know, as we look at frameworks, is that the things that we did five, 10 years ago, at least in my perspective, don't really work anymore for how we're moving forward in the future. You heard a lot of the speakers earlier talk about the new generation of millennials. Um, I look at it even bigger in terms of the global footprint, the amount of data that's coming in, the amount, how, amount of work and the work hours are taking over our lives. Um, everyone showed data, so I had to do my one data slide, um, but this is it. The rest I just wanna kind of talk with the group. But I think it's, it's really ironic that we had to put a, uh, you know, a circle graph chart about how everyone spends you know, the 24 hours of their day. And I think you'll see this changing dramatically over time because we're all connected you know, with our mobile devices. We're all working, or if you do work for a global company, taking very late night you know, calls or early morning calls to stay connected to the global audience. So with a changing environment and with a changing workforce or a changing culture, I thought that we also needed a changed or a different framework. While there are lots of frameworks out there, I wanted to go backwards a little bit and use something that I think if you took psychology classes in high school or college, um, to go back to something that really resonated with me, and that's Maslow's hierarchy. So in 1943, Abraham Maslow wrote a paper and really talked about the hierarchy of needs. Um, this applied specifically to individuals and the things that individuals needed as they matured and really looked at five levels um, you know, that, that were need-based if you looked at it. What I want to argue or at least present a framework that we're using at Polycom is how we're using this hierarchy to consider the programs and the processes that would make Polycom a great place to work. So I'll go through each of these and then give some examples in terms of what we're doing as well. So if you're familiar with the first level, it's physiological. These are things like food, water, clothing, and shelter. And you think, okay, great, I can do that personally. I've got a roof over my head. I've got you know, food in my mouth. How can that possibly relate to the workplace? So had to think about this, but I think if you look at some examples, it becomes very clear about ways that we can think about the physiological needs of the employers within the organization. So we heard a lot of great examples about does your workspace align to your job responsibilities, right? We have people that love cubes, that hate cubes, love offices, that hate offices, that telecommute, that have to go into the office. I think more, more connected should be the way that your space is designed for your job responsibilities. So think about that as that kind of shelter need. Can you work virtually? We've heard about this as not only as a differentiator for talent, but a way to get people engaged, motivated, and productive. Is there time built in your day to eat, reflect, and learn? I thought this was kind of funny as I looked about the, at the food level of, of the physiological needs, but how many people here eat lunch at their desk and work while they eat lunch? Okay, that's probably about 75, 80%, right? 
The reality is, is you're stuffing a little bit of food in your mouth with a little bit of time you have. You're not getting that time to reflect and that time to, to kind of debrief a little bit. Um, also, how many people sleep with their mobile phones near their bed at night? How many people are up at night thinking about what I didn't do today or what I got to do tomorrow? Right? So the work is now entering your evening life. Right? Are you up at night? Are you sleeping well? Are you not sleeping well? That's going to impact your productivity and your innovation um, the next day. I want to give a couple brief examples, but for Polycom as well with our engineers, you know, we broke down those cube walls. We actually created just open creative space where people could work together and solve challenges. I love the, the examples that my colleagues used before, and now that works so well, we're starting to look at it in other functions as well. So the next level is around safety. This can be physical safety. This can be financial safety and security. Um, if you're in manufacturing, this could be you know, safety around the work environment and also health and well-being. So from a workplace standpoint, have you in in initiated wellness programs in your organization? What innovative approaches do you have for using short and long-term rewards? Again, to tie to that financial stability question that I think many um, individuals are asking for when they're looking at potentially coming into companies. If you're in manufacturing, how safe are your working conditions? If you're in OSHA environment, got to you know, keep people's fingers and toes on uh, for them to be productive um, in the workplace. And I think really importantly is do your empl employees believe they have job security? You know, gone are the days of my parents when, you know, you would work at a GM factory for 30 or 40 years and you had a pension and you could retire on that. That's all different and that's all changed. So how can you differentiate from your company's perspective to become a great place to work to make these things happen? From a wellness program, one of our functions at Polycom is using an innovative approach and we're buying um, those little Fitbits. Um, for every employee in the function. Not only is that driving an idea around health and wellness, but the tools and technologies that come with that Fitbit like communities actually create some fun competition between groups. And we strongly believe that there's a, there's a real connection between health and wellness and then productivity, getting on the job, you know, innovation and overall engagement. Social needs, so these are things like friends, family, dare I say, intimacy. Um, so how the hell can that translate? I don't really want to talk about intimacy in the, in the workplace environment, but there are some things that you can think about. Do you feel connected to your team? This is really critical, and I think you hear people say you don't leave your job, you leave your manager, right? If you're not connected, or if you're a virtual worker, do you feel connected to the work that you and your colleagues are doing? Um, this is a great question. Do you have a best friend at work? How many people would say they have a best friend at work? Raise your hand. Uh, okay, so a couple. Um, if you've seen Gallup's work around this, they have a great survey that they do from an engagement standpoint. And this is probably one of the most controversial questions, but it really indicates whether people feel trust in an organization, whether they come to, to work every day and are excited about it. Think about working with your best friend every day. That's probably good and that's probably bad in some ways, but again, it's connected to this social need from Maslow's perspective. Do you believe in your company's products and services? Again, one of the data points we see from millennials is they really want to believe in what the company is doing and the impact that they're making to the world around them. And is there a spirit of belonging to something bigger? That you're connected, you're making a difference. And I think we heard about that um, uh, from John when it came to the work that's being done at Facebook. Um, so from, from our perspective, we've had to do some things a little bit more radical because much of our tools and technologies around video and audio conferencing, so we have a lot of virtual workers. So we have to do some things to step it up even more to create that social connectedness within the organization. So one of the things that we had, and this might seem ironic, is our executives would like to stay in the kind of corner area of, uh, of the executive area, and they were busy with meetings and customers and all kinds of things. And so we had to physically pull them out, and we created what may seem odd, but is actually working really well, these walking tours with our executives to walk to other floors and just to meet people in the organization at their desk or at their cube or at their creative workspace. So this is a brilliant idea by me. The first, the first day, it didn't go so well because one of our employees, this was a time where we were doing some layoffs, and, uh, and all of a sudden the CEO popped their head in one of our people's cubes, which scared the hell out of them. Um, but the idea worked really well, is that the executives were able to get out and really talk to people, really create this sense of community, really create a sense of connectedness as well. And then 
I think this is important, especially for organizations that are virtual. If you're in a non-corporate or you're in a remote worker location, how do you feel aligned or connected to the vision and mission of the organization? I think it's really easy for folks that are not in headquarters or not in uh, a physical location to feel disconnected. And I think you have to do extra work to make those folks feel connected. And we do a lot of videos and stories because we're a video co company. We tell a lot of stories over our, uh, over our internet with videos, telling pe having people tell stories of the work they're doing and how they're connected to the overall corporate mission and vision, which helps a lot and really gets the message out that those people are just as valued as the folks in the corporate office. The next level in Maslow's hierarchy is the level of esteem. So these are things like um, trust, these are things like rewards and recognition, even the idea of fame and visibility that are really important within an organization. So for the workplace, think about a couple of things here. How effective are your recognition programs? So at prior companies, you know, every time I hit a year, I would get a little gold pin. That was the idea of recognition. Uh, how many people got gold pins at some point in their career? How many people still have those gold pins? One, wow, okay, we need to talk. Um, but you know, I got mine and they went right in my drawer and I never looked at them again. Could that money be spent more effectively in other ways? Um, how do I recognize when people um, you know, remain in the company or hit a milestone with a company that's really critical? I think as HR professionals, we always think about investing in the development of our employees. This is, I think, one thing we see not only in millennials, but especially in India and China as a much more effective retention and, and esteem building tool than money. You know, is the opportunity to be developed, the opportunity to grow, the opportunity to take new roles and new opportunities, especially even coming into the US and having those opportunities as well. How much uh, opportunity for internal promotions exist? How much visibility is there? for those opportunities as well. Um, so I have responsibility both for talent management and recruiting at Polycom. And one of the things that we saw was that we were doing great on the outside. Uh, we were going out and, and hiring a lot at the senior levels. We weren't doing so great on the inside. In about a year and a half, we were able to change the mix of hiring outside um, to hiring inside. Uh, as a matter of fact, when, we, when I first got there, we were hiring or promoting inside at the director and above level about 12 or 13 percent. After a year and a half, we're now 49 percent of promoting inside. And that is really about showcasing these internal opportunities, having transparent talent practices that bring those names of the individuals up to the forefront, and then acting on them and making sure they're the first people on the slates that are considered before we go outside, unless we need some very unique or critical skill sets. And then are your employees rewarded above or at market value, right? I think there's always you know, this idea of being recognized for the true value you know, of what you bring to the table. And money is, we have to all recognize this, you know, a, a big part of that. So as you go and look, about, look at your total rewards programs, as you evaluate yourself against the marketplace, are you doing more for those really critical or tough to hire positions that you, that you need um, as well? And then what level of autonomy exists? And I think this is really critical when it comes to this level of esteem is that people feel they have autonomy not only to do their jobs, to make decisions, um, and to impact the organization uh, at a global level. And then the last one is self-actualization. Uh, and if you go back to Maslow's work, this is actually the most difficult to attain. And you have to have mastered all the previous four levels of the hierarchy before you can actually achieve self-actualization. So how the heck can you do that in the workplace? Um, this goes back to the old army adage of being all you can be. This is all about achieving one's potential. So the big question I would ask, or that we asked ourselves at Polycom, is is there an opportunity to reach one's potential within the organization? Are you limited to grow hierarchically, right? And you'll hear from one of my colleagues in a little while about career and corporate lattices, about opportunities to grow horizontally, to broaden your scope and your opportunities. How often are top talent rotated, developed, and provided visibility across the company? Does your goal planning check a box, or does it actually make a difference? I think if career development is done really well, you can help people achieve their full potential if you give them a path, if you give them clear and honest feedback about their opportunities, about their strengths and their areas for development. And lastly, and I think most importantly, we've been playing a lot with this, is HR transparent. You know, we used to, five, 10 years ago, we used to talk about HR having a seat at the table, right? And that was always the, you know, the big goal that we have is to have a seat at the table. Great, now you got a seat at the table, what do you do with it? Do you hoard your data? Do you share information? Are you pushing the envelope on the business side? 
or are you being transparent? Um, so one of the things that we did at Polycom is the company is about 20 years old. We had our first ever uh, enterprise talent review last year. And one of the things that I told our executives, I said, coming out of this talent review, I'm going to sit down with each of the successors that we've identified during this process, and I'm going to tell them that they're a successor. I'm going to tell them for what job. I'm going to tell them why they were picked. I'm going to tell them what they need to do to grow and set expectations that you're not on this list next year. This is dependent on performance, and there's no guarantees in life. The result of those conversations was probably the most profound I've had in my HR career. And that was not only for the conversation and the appreciation that I had uh, from the folks that I was talking to, but also the fact that they went back to their manager, they went back to their colleagues, and they told them about the conversation. And that not only engaged and retained that critical talent, but it also got other people excited coming to me and saying, hey, how do I get on that list? What do I need to do? And that uh, enabled me and other people to have honest and candid conversations with those leaders as well. This is a tough one, I think, and I think many organizations go back and forth between how transparent can you be, how much data do you need to hold, what are the risks? But I think you, you saw John you know, say earlier at Facebook, if you don't take the risk, you're never going to see if you're going to reap the reward. And for us, it's proven um, very, very valuable. So in summary, you know, I just wanted to kind of refresh on, on the five levels from Maslow. And really, if it helps you to utilize this framework for your own thoughts about becoming a blessed place to work, for us, it's provided us the context. It's also provided us a model. And it's connected us back to some very um, basic psychological research about how do we help individuals and organizations. So thank you.